connection to your science night. Please stand by. Welcome back to another episode of the Science Night Podcast. I am James, and with me tonight, as always, is Steffi. Hi. And Jason. Hello, friends. Tonight, we're talking about vulture bees, a prelude to the robot apocalypse, and the second half will feature my conversation with Dr. Zane Thayer, an anthropologist that researches stress. But first, the news. So we want to start off just talking about the headlines, and we have been hearing about the Omicron variant of the COVID-19 virus a lot lately, and we don't really have a lot of information to share with you other than just doubling down on the things that we have been doing for the last two years, which is wearing a mask, washing your hands, and socially distancing from each other, the thing that we definitely want to add is to get vaccinated. If you are fully vaccinated and have been for six months or more, you should definitely look into getting your booster shots. I would say uh, after you look into getting your booster shot, go get it. Yeah. Did I not say that? Oh, yeah. (laughs) Definitely. (laughs) Just do it. Yeah. Hey, hey, Nike, we're stealing it. Just do it. Uh. I got it. It was pretty awesome. Okay, I just wanted to add some late-breaking fusion news that came out this morning. And by this morning, I mean Wednesday, December 1st. It was just announced that Commonwealth Fusion Systems raised $1.8 billion in funding on their path to commercializing fusion energy. This is really exciting. Uh, For people who don't know, Commonwealth Fusion Systems is a private fusion company that spun out of the um, MIT Plasma Fusion Science Center. So what Commonwealth Fusion Systems is building is a device called Spark that will be demonstrating that they can produce more power out than they put in from fusion energy. So this is exciting, and they have an aggressive timeline of uh, building and demonstrating this in 2025. Super exciting. Yep. Super exciting for the Commonwealth. Yeah. It's very cool. It's really <laughs> yeah. cool. And I, I just want to point out that the name Spark is really reminiscent of the all spark from the transformers and it makes a lot of sense oh yeah i love it and their next device down the line which is geared towards commercializing fusion power is called the arc reactor or arc (laughs) it's the arc reactor it's a reactor it's called arc yeah it's the arc reactor this is such cool news it really is it is because everyone's saying you know fusion's always forever away what people don't realize is we've never built an experiment that's designed specifically to prove we can create energy from fusion for commercial use. So this is the first besides ITER, which is a longer timeline. So we all remember the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic in early 2020, when Tiger King was on everyone's TV and murder hornets were lurking around every corner. And we are not going to be talking about the Asian giant hornet, but a cousin has recently started grabbing those headlines. Most bees get their nutrition by producing honey from plant nectar, and some are omnivorous and they will occasionally eat rotting flesh. But most of that energy is coming from the honey that is produced by pollen. However, we're going to talk about a species of bee that firmly fits into our weird science category. The vulture bee, or Trigona hypogea, only eat meat. In a new paper, a group of scientists from the University of California, Riverside, University of Massachusetts, Amherst, and Columbia University studied these vulture bees and found that their gut bacteria is similar to what you would expect to find in other scavengers like hyenas and, of course, vultures. This is, this is wild. I didn't know that there were vulture bees. This is crazy. And I feel like we should not bury the lead. We should absolutely say right off the bat that, yes, they do still make honey. And also, yes, the researchers in this group did taste that honey. And they were like, oh, it's fine. It was honey. And they're like, don't worry. They store the meat on the other side of the honeycomb. It's okay. It's all good. (laughs) They have a honey fridge and a meat fridge. That's a really important point. I mean, maybe the health inspectors need to uh, take some notes, right? Where do you store? And I guess if you can clog up the individual stalls within the honeycomb with, 
you know, the precursors to honey and the waxy substance. I don't remember what that's called. Use that in your food service industry too. Maybe it's the safest way to do things. I mean, the scientists didn't say they tasted the meat part of the honeycomb. (laughs) Just the honey. (laughs) Just the honey from it. That's fair. That's fair. When the baseline is rotting, I feel like it it can't be like a good situation, right? It comes in rotting. (laughs) I think that is something that we probably have a hard time understanding since most of us tend not to be scavengers and we're not scavenging rotting meat. If we're going to eat meat, we're going to usually eat fresh meat, or at least ideally. I think what's important here is that the the research was actually not about just identifying the fact that these bees exist. What the scientists were interested really in understanding was how the gut microbiome or the bacteria that are found in the guts of these bees differ perhaps from you know, honeybees or stingless bees or other kinds of bees. And so what they found is that one of the bacteria that's present in these vulture bees, these it's called lactobacillus. It's also in a lot of humans fermented food, including sourdough, which is something that we all were familiar with, <laughs> at least from TikTok early on in the pandemic as well. So murder hornets, sourdough, it's all coming full circle in vulture bees, right? Um, But anyway, one of the bacteria that they have is this lactobacillus and another one called carnobacterium, which is both of these are important for digestion of flesh or some kind of digestion of fermented something. You know, it's really interesting that the microbiome of these bees is very different and perhaps more similar to things like carrion beetles. They are found in, obviously, in nature um, as part of the, you know, the ecosystem that breaks down tissue and takes, you know, living organisms back to their basic elements, dust to dust, so to speak. I would be very curious to know whether or not these carrion beetles have these same kinds of microbiomes in their guts. And that wasn't clear from this research, um, although I suspect that's where this is headed. Yeah. And then you can make another leap and research project and talk about how do we change the gut microbiome? Can we experimentally change the gut microbiome of these bees and see if they start acting differently? Is the microbiome driving behavior? You know, they talked about the gut microbiome. They did have controls, by the way. This yeah. is a good paper where where they talked about the gut microbiome of what they called vegetarian bees. But I think everyone else can just be like, <laughs> bees. bees. <laughs> Uh, and and it was very different. And the the omnivorous bee that occasionally eats meat tends to have like the omnivorous microbiome. So it fit their their data fit beautifully within their hypothesis. So this is like this is also just a good version of when everything kind of comes together. <laughs> well, and it's not like these are found everywhere too. So there's only three species of these bees, and they're found in rainforests. And so they evolved specifically, and they only get their protein from fresh meat. So it's very localized, too. But I don't know how far they've looked for these vulture bees or how long this study has been going on. Also fascinating was the way that the researchers collected data here. Um, I thought this was really, really fascinating because they basically hung strands of rotting flesh in trees from strings to try to collect you know, meat-eating vulture bees. One of the things that that they did to sort of combat contamination from other species was, and they were particularly interested in make, keeping ants away from this meat, uh, was to, you know, on the string that was holding the rotting flesh from the trees, they they applied a whole lot of petroleum jelly. So, so in my mind, I'm just thinking like, here are all these ants in a line, marching up this tree. They see these strings, they're coming across, and then one by one, they just slide down, whee! down and boom. Or you're just, you know, walking through the rainforest and you happen upon all this chicken hanging from the trees. <laughs> and you're like, I have no idea what's going on here. It's science. Uh, let's move to our next story uh, that I'm sure it will not be a herald to the end of humanity as we know it. So back in January 2020, this is something that kind of was not on, somehow this escaped my radar. Maybe it's because we weren't recording at the time and I wasn't looking at the the darker sides of of popular science reporting. But back in January of 2020, a group of scientists from the University of Vermont, Tufts University, and Harvard University, uh, you know, I rank them in levels of prestige, uh, reported that they created the first living robots by scraping stem cells from the skin of an African clawed fraud. And they used those stem cells from the skin 
to form these clumps of stem cells that they then used a supercomputer to cut into specific shapes, which would then somehow inform how these new things acted. And they called them xenobots, reportedly after the scientific name of the frog from which they were derived, uh, Xenopus lavis. But also because xenobots sounds like the thing that will eventually take over the world. And obviously, I am being a little bit sensational as the initial article ended with the assurance that these were one-off artifacts. They could self-heal, but they could not self-replicate. Um, so, end of story. We're all fine. Uh, hold, hold on a second. Uh, what, what was that? Uh, hold on. Um, this just came across the transom. Uh, it's a note from the team that worked on this, uh, and, and it says, uh, our bad, we did an oopsie, and it looks like they can totally self-replicate by forming clumps of stem cells into balls that develop into new xenobots, but they're totally contained and can easily be killed off before it gets out of hand, just like Skynet and the Geth from Nass Effect and <laughs> Xenomorphs from Alien, and no need to worry. That's how it so, starts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the new article that just came out two days ago, the 29th of November, is basically saying they can self-replicate, and it's a way we've never seen anything self-replicate. But it also ends with an oddly specific, but we could totally kill them right away. <laughs> so, what what do we think about this? Uh, do we start looking for uh, our John Connor now, or <laughs> or uh, what, what? what's the next step? Can we just, like, acknowledge that it's little tiny Pac-Mans? Yeah. <laughs> that yes. are self-replicating? So what the scientists did is they used, the, with the help of AI, researchers tested a billions of body shapes to make the, the xenobots more effective at this type of replication. And the supercomputer came back with the, the shape of Pac-Man. Mm -hmm. And you can actually watch the video of these little organisms going around and collecting all of these cells. I didn't, I should have looked into this more, but I didn't. Do we know if that video was in real time? It couldn't have been in real time, right? Like that was a, a, a sped up version, hopefully. I really hope so. Because they not, were moving around pretty good in that video. I'm not sure that they are. And the reason that, I'm not sure they're sped up. And the reason I say that is that if I'm looking at the original paper here in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, and one of the last paragraphs starts with this sentence. It says, the swarm builds p piles, which, if large enough, develop into offspring, and the dissociated cells are replenished every 3.5 seconds. Oh, so that is the lead buried, I think, right there. Mm -hmm. um, okay. This is happening quickly. And, uh, and they're referring to them as the swarm. <laughs> that's correct. That's how it starts. Right. This is so cool, I have to say. Um, <laughs> it really is cool stuff. But what is most interesting to me is that this is, again, another example of science for science sake. There is not a known application for this. It's not being driven by a need, right? They say that um, necessity is the mother of all invention, right? There's not a necessary need to fill here. Instead, this is science for discovery sake much like fusion was science for discovery's sake initially, right? And now there is app. I mean, there's always been an application for it, but like being able to do that, right? To be able to harness these things or create science in a new way with funding without an application down the road is what the National Science Foundation is all about, right? National Institutes of Health, for example, there has to be a human health problem you're solving and it has to be directly tied in to get that kind of funding. But to get National Science Foundation funding, you don't have to have an application. You have to have a potential benefit to society. I mean, that's a little bit different, right? Like what could these things be used for? Now, it's amazing to me that there is no known or appreciated utility for this at this point because it seems to be happening very quickly. So it'll be interesting to see sort of how this, dare I say it, fleshes out over the next several years because there's some new technology here that's really interesting. And the idea that we've got this self-replicating, AI-driven, organic robot is terrifying. All the buzzwords, right? <laughs> All the buzzwords. All the best oh. ones. 
together. Yeah. <laughs> I guess we have to say is as far as science, like experimental bleeding edge science goes, it's happening kind of quickly too. Like the mm-hmm. first paper was reported uh, January of this year. And now, you know, just 11 months, oh, about 12 months later, we're like, oh, yeah, and they're self-replicating. Uh, you know, this thing that just existed is now self-replicating. So by March, we'll, they'll be sentient. And <laughs> um, <laughs> five years from now, uh, who knows? Well, I mean, sometimes you find these groundbreaking discoveries or these fundamental things, and it takes a while to find the right application to get mm-hmm. things that'll actually work in the real world. So come of the, some of the things they hypothesize you might be able or suggested you might be able to do is collecting microplastics in the ocean. Yeah, So they right, could send right. these out. Rege- regenerative med- medicine was another thing that they mentioned to some applications, but right. it yeah. takes a while. Yeah, and it, they made no clear connection as to how that would work, right? So those were thrown yep. out there as potentials, but they didn't make a connection to how that would work mechanistically. Um, and so I'll be curious to see how that sort of develops. What is really cool, though, to me, and we're seeing this also now back to discussion about COVID, is, is the pace of science has exploded over the last 10 years, over the last five years even. And a lot of it is perhaps due to the advent of preprint servers to post data. Um, and so let's talk about that for a second, right? Because a lot of times we're seeing policy decisions being made based on the latest, greatest science, but it hasn't been through the peer review process yet. It's been put up into a, a preprint server like BioArchive. And so what's the point of that? Well, the point of those initially was were to, to provide a space where um, researchers who were applying for grants could store data or analyze data so that they could point to it in their grant application and say, look, this is what we have seen so far. It's in the review process, but we want to make it available for reviewers to look at right now um, because it's not been published yet. It hasn't finished the peer review process, but it's important for the story we're trying to tell and the questions we're trying to answer based on the, the most recent or the current grant application. That's fantastic. And, you know, there was a lot of sort of hemming and hawing about whether this would be good or bad for science um, initially. it Clearly, it's been good for science. The thing about it is that it's also been bad for science communication because a lot of times what the public doesn't see is that all of these policy decisions are being made on stuff that hasn't actually made it through peer review yet and so may not be the final story on that. And, and actually, science is never settled. That's the other issue, right? We talk about settled science. Science, by definition, is never settled. It is always going undergoing repeated testing, and that's how we develop things like laws, right? Scientific laws and scientific theories, which is about as much as you can get, right? There's the theory of evolution. People like to say it's just a theory, but so is gravity. And I guarantee you, when I drop the pencil that I'm holding in my hand, it's going to hit the floor as long as I'm on Earth and not in a vacuum. These things are important for us to understand. It's amazing to me how we are able to move so quickly in part because of sharing of data um, so rapidly through these preprint servers. Now, I'm not sure that this stuff has been published, this particular AI robot stuff has been published in preprint servers. It likely has somewhere along the line, but think about how quickly we now have the genome for the Omicron variant of you know COVID-19. When they initially identified the first original strain, right? It was something like 78 days before there was uh, a sequenced genome and uh, the ability to develop a therapeutic, right? And to test it. And here we are just like two weeks after Omicron and vaccine makers are already testing the ability of their vaccines to work against it. And also are starting to look at whether or not it's possible for boosters to be specific to Omicron because they have that genome, right? It's amazing how quickly we can do this stuff. And this is sort of a testament to that. First, they weren't replicating, self-replicating, and now, you know, not too long after, they're self-replicating. And it may be because there are multiple people looking at this problem. I guess the thing that was most interesting to me when you talked about all the, when Steffi talked about the potential uses that they had said for this was uh, all from the original paper of like, Hey, we created Xenobots and the, Oh, they're self-replicating. They weren't like, and we could probably put them in an artery or we could probably just let them loose in the ocean. It was like, 
they can self-replicate their all-in-one petri dish that we have like sitting over a fire just in case we have to like pull something and and send them into it. <laughs> it, it just took a very different tone for this this reporting of the new Xenobot uh, thing. They're also biodegradable. Which is sure. really important. No, no, that's <laughs> good. Go. Yeah. If if they will allow themselves to degrade. Yeah. Right? And that's the problem is that they're self-replicating now. And uh, it appears that they can compensate for deficiencies in 3.5 seconds. And so <laughs> are they really biodegradable? I'm not sure. Right. I mean, it's, it's a degree. Right. I'm they could be degraded realizing. a little bit. Yeah. I mean, I'm also realize. Yeah. So they're biodegradable in the sense they have short lifespans. Right. But if they are infinitely replicatable. <laughs> Um, I'm also realizing now that apparently Jurassic Park was right and we just need to use frogs for all these weird scientific experiments uh, and uh, just just swap in frogs for whatever you're looking for because apparently it always works apparently, yeah yeah it always works nothing ever goes wrong um, life right. uh, life finds, finds a way. way meat honey robot apocalypse I gotta tell you writing this episode has been a little stressful so it's good that our guest today studies the evolution of stress, how it affects us, specifically pregnant people, and leaves us with some tips in managing it. That is going to come up next, but first, a quick commercial break. Nature, we're part of it. Animals, we're one of them. What can we learn from other species? How can our lives be better by reconnecting with nature? And why does it matter at all? That's what Wild Connection, the podcast, is all about. Every week, we bring you authors, filmmakers, scientists, and conservationists whose work is revealing why being connected to nature and wildlife matters. You can find us where you get your podcasts, including iTunes, Google Play, and Spotify. We're hosted by Podbean, so you can find us there too. And you can keep up with us on Twitter at Wild Connect Pod. Today, I have the absolute joy of talking to Dr. Zane Thayer. She is an associate professor of anthropology at Dartmouth College and researches how and why a person's environment and life experiences shape biology, and ultimately their health. She's also been at the very top of my list to have as a guest all the way back to when this was just a humble live event in the Upper Valley of Vermont and New Hampshire. Zane, I am so happy to finally have you on this podcast. Thanks so much. It's my pleasure to be here. I hinted at what your research interests are and like... I really wanted to have you on, so we're going to do this, but like my audience is PhD students and early, early career scientists and people studying for exams. And you research this kind of esoteric topic. It's, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to butcher this. Str stra Strass? Str str I'm going to, I'm going to stop bearing the lead. You research st stress, which every category I just listed knows a lot about, including me talking to you, someone I very much appreciate using their time while I say stupid jokes. Yeah. So um, thanks for that introduction also. So I study the effects of stress on health, which ironically is a somewhat stressful exercise as all research is. A lot of my work involves asking people about their you know, day to day and lived experiences, and then trying to see whether or how that relates to different, what we call biomarkers of stress. So these are hormones that we can measure in saliva, for example. And so trying to understand how people's perceive stress about exams or worry about living in an unsafe neighborhood, how those things may relate to stress hormones that we can measure. And I'm sure you're here to let us all know that it's all sunshine and roses and that there is no correlation to stress and health. Uh, that is correct. Correct? 
Yeah, nah, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> um, so stress is bad for you, um, which is why, again, it's uh, always sad to be a stress researcher and discover these things. But in having studied this for a long time, I do think that there are some lessons that I've learned that I try to impart on others. So as an example, I think it's really important for us to focus on the stress that's within our control and handle and manage those things and try and let go to the extent possible, those stressors out of our control. So as an example, if we're really stressed about an upcoming an exam or having to give some sort of podcast interview, <laughs> um, in some instances, we can actually try and prepare for those things, right? We can study for the exam, or we can be appropriately caffeinated for said podcast interview. And those things give us a bit of agency and can help us to manage our stress levels. But of course, not all stress is within our control, right? And a lot of my research has focused on the impacts of things like poverty and racism on stress and health. And part of the reason why I think those types of stressors are so harmful is because they deal with a lot of stress that we as individuals can't control easily, right? If you, if you live in an unsafe neighborhood and you're worried about whether you're going to get mugged on your way home, like that's not something you can control easily. And so in that instance, I think that the implications of that work is that there's a lot of structural factors that we need to try to address in order to reduce people's exposure to those types of stressors and improve health. You do specifically a lot of work in how stress during pregnancy can have long-term effects. Can you talk a little bit about, uh, about that work and that research? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, what I've been describing so far is about how stress can impact your own individual health and well-being. But a really important insight that we've come around to in the last 10 or 15 years is that maternal stress experience can actually influence offspring growth and development. So in my own work and in that of others, we look at uh, maternal stress exposure and measure maternal stress hormones in pregnancy. And we find that those measures are associated with things like offspring birth outcomes in terms of child stress hormones in terms of, and in terms of children's mental and physical health into adulthood. What we're coming to understand is that maternal health and well-being is not only important for influencing her health, but also for her children's health as well. And I think one other important thing I want to say about that is in this research, sometimes then there can be a lot of focus on mothers and sometimes almost inappropriate focus on mothers, because now all of a sudden a mom's not only responsible for her own well-being, but that of her children. <laughs> so there is important research also talking about paternal stress, for example, and how that can actually influence offspring development as well. And, and a big takeaway from all this is that we should do our best to not hold individuals responsible. Like we need to think about these broader structural factors that are influencing people's stress levels to start with. Absolutely. You know, you can, you can look at this research and see how a propagation of stress over, a, over generations, as you're finding and talking about, you can't just find a person and be like, you should really think about doing a little bit of yoga this morning. It's, it's more of a structural thing, right? It's, I mean, I know you just said that. So it's more of a systemic thing at that point. You have to look at the really big factors. Have you found specific stressors in these populations that were more common than others, more things that kind of outweighed other factors? Maybe like specific working points that, that we can have that we could maybe give to like a legislature or something like that? Yeah, that's a really great question. So, you know, when I do my research and I talk to pregnant people and I say, what stresses you out? There is a whole multitude of responses, right? Most people feel stress of some sort. We're still trying to understand is which types of stressors have the greatest impacts on, you know, maternal stress physiology, for example, and offspring growth and development. As I mentioned previously, a lot of my work is focused on impacts of poverty and racism specifically. And in those instances, we find that folks who are experiencing a lot of poverty, as I've measured by things like material deprivation, which is specifically about a lack of access to things like fresh fruit or vegetables or sufficient heating, that type of stress is very strongly associated with increased stress hormone levels in pregnancy. Um, and changes in offspring stress physiology. Uh, and so it might be that which stressors are quote unquote most important are those that 
are stressors associated with uncertainty, like I kind of alluded to previously. Mm -hmm. Um, So stressors that are outside of an individual's control. But we have a lot more work we need to do to kind of understand the impacts of all these different types of stress. So uh, another project that I'm starting actually is around childbirth fear. Um, So Mm -hmm. trying to understand how people's fear and concerns around their childbirth experience. Some of those are, you know, internal to self insofar as individuals are afraid of the pain they'll experience or if they won't be able to to do it. But many of the fears are also associated with the actual birth environment they're going to be in. So they're afraid of being mistreated by hospital staff, for example, or not having sufficient support there. And so uh, trying to understand how Fears related to childbirth then may also be an important stressor in pregnancy that could be impacting maternal, mental health, physical health, and potentially offspring development. Maybe I should really focus on making this an evergreen episode, but we are in the (laughs) middle of a worldwide pandemic and we can't do anything but think about that. Even though there is some light at the end of the tunnel, my five-year-old got her first dose of the vaccine oh, just a couple of days ago. It's a really great day right now, but who knows what the future is going to bring. I I can't imagine that this didn't give you an odd, kind of a, a very once-in-a-career opportunity to experience how stress and how pregnant people are feeling stress in a pandemic how that affected outcomes. Did you have an opportunity to study anything during this time? (laughs) Yeah. Well, hopefully a once in a career opportunity. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, Um, exactly. (laughs) But yeah. So as I've already alluded to, I've been trying to study and understand the impacts of uh, maternal stress for a while now. And when the pandemic happened, all these news stories were coming out talking about how pregnant people were having really disrupted care experiences. So they were going to the hospital and not allowed to have all of their support persons. They were being told if they tested positive for COVID that their newborn would be taken away from them and mm. separated. Um, you know, normal systems of support, such as friends or family that might come and help you after the baby's born, bringing food or watching your other kids. All of a sudden, those systems of care were disrupted. And so uh, my postdoc at the time, Dr. Teresa Gildner and I put together this uh, COVID-19 and reproductive effects, the care study, and we launched it in April 2020, trying to understand how the pandemic was impacting maternity care experiences um, and the potential impacts of that on maternal mental health and also offspring development. So we put together an awesome research team of undergrads and some graduate students at Dartmouth and worked on trying to do a bunch of analyses that we thought would be of quote unquote greatest public health relevance, mm-hmm. kind of as like our contribution, right? In those early days, it was kind of, there was this like call out, what can people do to contribute to this effort? And so that was what we felt like we could contribute, some, some research skills. Did you find anything significant, any significant changes to care plans, maybe even just the reluctance to go into an institution during that time? Yeah. So that was one of the actually really interesting findings is that within our cultural context, it's kind of become the norm to have hospital birth. So in 1900 in the U.S., for example, less than 1% of births were in the hospital. But by the 1960s, less than 1% of births were outside the hospital. So it's over the last century, we've had a really dramatic shift in where people give birth and therefore the assumption of where is the safest place to give birth. Mm -hmm. Um, So for many people in the U.S., it's been assumed that the hospital is the safest place to give birth. And the pandemic kind of put a a spin on that, right? Because all of a sudden people were saying, oh, wait, the hospital is where sick people go. (laughs) This is where (laughs) people who have COVID go. I don't want to go where sick people are to have my baby. And so there are some out of hospital birth options, including home birth or in places where they're available, freestanding birth centers. And there's lots of structural reasons why Americans have not had good access to those alternative birth spaces across time. But during the pandemic, there was a much broader interest in trying to explore these out of birth options, which was a really interesting thing to see. And so, you know, we talked to our participants about it and there was a substantial number of participants who discussed how both in this pregnancy and if they were to, you know, have another baby in the future, 
that they would actually be interested in exploring more out of hospital birth options because they realize that these could be good options Mm -hmm. for people who have low risk pregnancies. You know, I hear that and it is exciting to know that people are thinking about alternatives when they need to think about alternatives. But I I think back to your other work about people in areas where there is maybe systemic difficulties in finding access to not just the basic care that they need, but now we're talking about maybe the thing that they feel more comfortable with. And do you see this as potentially another way to kind of widen that gap between those people who have access to their desired care and those people who have to kind of deal within the system that they have around them? Yeah, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. So as much interest as there may be in out of hospital birth options, or even in different models of maternity care, as indexed by obstetrician, as opposed to midwifery led care, right, because these are different kind of approaches towards childbirth. Even if an individual identifies that they have a preference, they aren't necessarily going to have access to that. Sure. And yeah. people who are poor are probably more likely to not have access to their preferred model of care. So that's another example of where structural factors are really important. So, you know, simple things like having Medicaid, which funds half of the births in the U.S., you know, allowing midwives to be reimbursed at the same rate as obstetricians or allowing Medicaid to pay for home births, for example, which is not allowed. Right. So these are factors that mean that if an individual wants a home birth, they have to pay for it out of pocket. Right. Mm -hmm. Even though it's cheaper than a hospital birth, like many people can't afford to pay for that out of pocket. Addressing those upstream factors could then allow increased access. Um, And so a lot of my work has actually been in New Zealand. In New Zealand, midwives are the lead maternity carers for something like 80 or 90 percent of births, whereas in the U.S. it's they're present for, you know, 8 percent of births. Mm -hmm. And also in New Zealand, maternity care is 100% covered and you can have a baby wherever you want. You can have your baby at home in like a tertiary, so big major hospital or at a maternity care only sort of unit. And so in those instances, you can see that people can actually have a choice of where they want to give birth and it's Mm. free, right? No matter where. Yeah. I mean, what you're telling us is there is just another reason to look at New Zealand as a model (laughs) for ways that we can maybe improve some things. Uh, here in the United States. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's always going to be other, to like, list. absolutely. There's still, you know, issues there, such as if you're living in a rural area, you, you know, might not even have access to a big hospital sure. <laughs> if you want it. Um, so there's always some limits, but still, like, there are other ways we could do things that could be better. And, you know, you talk about the rural, you know, this this is where I talk about Upper Valley politics and uh, our access to things. So bo- both of the people listening that this is pertinent to uh, buckle up. Um, but, you know, we're in such a weird area where we have access to like a level one trauma center. But there's like this kind of hub of Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center again. Feel free to skip forward 25 seconds if you don't care about this. But but we don't have like a lot on the periphery, right? So it's like this interesting thing where we don't have a ton of access to alternative birthing situations, but we have like this huge, what do we call it? We call it an intensive care nursery, a NICU, most people would would think about it. And we have this huge birthing pavilion, and we have all of these really shiny objects that are also really expensive, but you really kind of got to travel if you don't live uh, within 30 miles. So it's, it's, it's interesting to think about the rural-urban divide, but then there's also these kind of clusters of situations like us where we have this very Western medicine focused hub and then a very barren periphery. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So in the Upper Valley, the options have been home birth, which is great, but not for everyone. Mm -hmm. Um, Then we have DHMC, which is a wonderful, like you said, level one trauma center. We do love you, DHMC. I I, I have to like, yes, you do great things. Yeah, yeah. Things go wrong. Like that's where you want to be. We are so fortunate to live in a rural area and have access to this wonderful center of care. But there's a lot of people that might be in between those two extremes, right? They might not be comfortable giving birth at home or their insurance might not cover home birth, but maybe they don't want the intense biomedicalized birth experience that can occur at DHMC. 
And so when I gave birth here three and a half years ago, there was still a small birthing pavilion at Alice Peck Day, which is a smaller community hospital. And the birthing center had three rooms and there were three midwives in the team. Um, And so it was great. And I got to know all the midwives. And when I gave birth, I was the only person in the birthing pavilion, (laughs) which was Mm. wonderful. But it closed two weeks after I was there because DHMC had bought that hospital and didn't want to run two maternity care centers. And so at that point, there was a dearth of other options. And then a, uh, a formerly home birth midwife, Katie Bramhall, started a freestanding birthing center, Gentle Landings Birth. Uh, which has just started, opened in Lebanon, opened its doors a few months ago. And that was a real Herculean effort putting that together. Sure. But she really wanted birthing people to have another option um, in the upper Valley. So we're very, very fortunate to now have that as another option because there's, there's no freestanding birth centers in the entire state of Vermont for reference. Oh, great. <laughs> and, pre- and previously the closest one was an hour away in Concord. So you talked a lot about stress and it's stressing me out a little bit. What can I do other than just endlessly scroll Twitter for the next 25 minutes to uh, kind of calm me down a little bit? Yeah, so that's a wonderful question. One thing, of course, is to try to manage the stress that's within our control to manage, right? So being as proactive as possible with the, you know, stressors that we face day to day. When you go to bed at night and rest your head, instead of thinking about all the emails you have to send the next day, think, I'm sitting in bed right now. I'm not going to send any emails. So I'm going to turn off my brain <laughs> and, and let it go until there's something I can actually do about it, right? Until I'm actually sitting at my computer. And then I'll think about all the things I need to do. But just trying to be present in the moment and know that if you're not addressing the thing right now, not to worry about it, like that's very freeing to me. Mm. Um, another thing is that When we're stressed, we have things like cortisol surging through our bodies. And we tend to think about high cortisol levels as this negative thing, right? Because we're talking about the negative impacts of chronic cortisol exposure. But in reality, this is meant to be an adaptive response. When you're stressed, cortisol helps you to have more energy and think more clearly. And so, one way to manage that is to try and do something productive with that energy i.e. exercise, (laughs) which of course is easier said than done. Like today, for example, I've been trying to exercise all day and I haven't made it because I haven't gotten off my computer and off Zoom calls. (laughs) Oh no, I'm I'm adding to your stress. (laughs) No, 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 no. Um, So of course, easier said than done. But if you can find that time, even if it's like leg lifts at your desk, whatever, (laughs) like using that energy productively is so good for your body. Even if it's, yeah, literally like arm lifts or leg lifts while at your desk. Mm. Social support is so important. In all of these studies we do, you know, having strong systems of support is a huge buffer against the negative impacts of stress. Having someone that you can talk to, paid (laughs) or family and friends, whatever, is really important for helping you to manage your stress. So it's not just if you, because many people who experience stress can do just fine, right? So finding systems of support, finding ways to like get out that energy are all really helpful um, and can help to improve your well being. That is all extremely, extremely great advice that I really hope I can follow. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm- it's, I'm still trying. Yeah. You know, that's, that's, uh, that's the danger of somebody in your field, right? Everyone mm. expects you to be like the pillar, the rock mm. that they can look to as a great excuse. I'm, I'm lucky that I do not have those expectations. So <laughs> I, I will not exemplify the high <laughs> stress, the stress relief, uh, lifestyle. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this has been like the most challenging year ever <laughs> for everyone. So anything we can do to get through it, you know, I, I don't know. It's been a hard year, but you know, we've... I think that's the best answer, right? Realize that none of us have it together. We're all just trying. Do what you need to do to get through the day in a healthy way. Obviously, we do not condone you doing crimes to de-stress. <laughs> uh, but just know that if you're feeling super stressed out, you are by no means alone. 
Yeah, I think that's an, a really important lesson. And with all, a lot of these different types of stress, actually, when we talk about birth fear, that's something that people can feel really guilty about or, um, and not want to talk about, not realize that that's a normal feeling. So again, getting back to the point of support, knowing that you're not alone in these feelings, um, that it's normal to have these feelings, but that there's ways to address these feelings and make it better. Like all of those things are really important, I think, and hopefully helpful for improving folks' well-being. So we started out by talking about how we are all doomed to experience stress, and we're finishing with some constructive and promising ways for you to cope with that and evolve along the way. Zane, thank you so much for talking to me. This has been an absolute joy. Is there anywhere where you would like to point our massive fan base to support you and learn more about the things that you do? Oh, so um, I'm not on social media. <laughs> Another great stress management device. You know, honestly, that is a huge stress management advice or uh, stress management approach because I realized I just can't keep up with social media. So I opt- I've opted out. And actually, I have a project I'm trying to develop with a student on uh, stress around TikTok. So stay tuned for that. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So if people want to find me just the old fashioned way, uh, Dartmouth Anthropology um, website, I've got a link to my lab homepage off of that. But if anyone's interested in talking about stress and health and mom and babies and these sorts of things, also welcome to reach out. Thank you so much. We ha- we will have links to everything that Dr. Thayer does on our website. Thank you so much for talking to me, Zane. Pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you to Dr. Zane Thayer for bringing down our stress levels just a bit. And I got to tell you, I read the Xenobot article after the interview with her and the urge to run was definitely there. So maybe there is something to this whole exercise thing. And we're going to have links to all kinds of stuff that Zane is working on at our website, cyanide.com. So be sure to check that out. This is going to do it for this episode. Oh, let me do that again. That is going to do it for this episode of the podcast. My name is James. If you want to follow me, head over to at James underscore read and the number three on Twitter. But I got to warn you, it is mostly complaining about Philadelphia sports at this point. So if that's your jam, head on over and we can just sulk together. Steffi, where can everyone find you, follow you? Where do you want to point our massive fan base? You can follow me at twi- on Twitter at Steffi Deem. I mostly tweet about fusion and randomly dogs and knitting. So join me. I gotta say, that was a pretty solid hat that you knitted yourself the other day. I, it was five stars all across Thank the you. board. Jason, where can the kids find you? You can find me also on Twitter, at OregonJM. I do not tweet about knitting. I do not tweet about dogs. But I do tweet about Missouri Tiger athletics and um, futility. And so <laughs> uh, you can find that all along my feed. If you want to follow the podcast, we are on Twitter at Science Night One and links to all our other socials because we're being active on across the board right now. You can find them on our website at SciNight.com, where you can also find links to the stuff that we talk about and to all of our past episodes. Thus ends another episode of the Science Night Podcast. We will be back in two weeks. And until then, have a great night. The Science Night Podcast is a proud member of the River Power Podcast Mill. To find out more about our shows, go to riverpower.xyz. It's just a Greek letter. Like, it shouldn't be that hard to get this one right. (laughs) No one uses it, though, unless there's a pandemic or something.